Welcome back, Wash Up Walk On fans. This is episode 106 of the podcast. And uh, today's a pretty exciting day for the three of us because we get to have a conversation with a man that we, uh, we have quite a bit of admiration for, um, a, a real legend of Iowa sports, somebody that we've enjoyed listening to and getting to know over the past few years. Um, I don't, I don't even really want to say too much else. I just want to bring him in and let y'all guys listen to him and his stories and, and the great things he has to say. So without any further ado, the man, myth, and legend only needs one name for an introduction. Dolph, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> hey, Drake. Uh, I'm humbled by that introduction, uh, but good to be on with you and, uh, and uh, our man Ward there and, and Tyler. And uh, we've uh, been trying to get this put together for some time. And uh, I'm into the podcast now, particularly uh, with, uh, frankly, nothing else to do uh, for <laughs> hopefully only four months when football starts back up again. But we don't want to make light of the fact that uh, COVID-19 has uh, been destructive to many families, uh, not only in Iowa, but around the, around the world and around the country. But uh, it is, uh, it's a timely visit because uh, we can hang out and uh, visit any number of subjects uh, regarding uh, Iowa football, certainly uh, uh, first and foremost, but Hawkeye athletics in general. So it's good to, good to hear you guys. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I enjoyed standing on the practice field and in Kinnick watching you guys play for for a, a few years, and uh, uh, now you, now you are accomplished broadcasters, so I'm impressed. <laughs> we, we're uh, far uh, from accomplished broadcasters. Nobody in their right mind would pay us to be on a broadcast. But, that is that is the biggest stretch I've ever heard come out of your mouth, Dolph. But we appreciate it. <laughs> hey, thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, as you, no, as it's you, fun. Yeah, Gary. Just as you sit there and and in kind of bring us in I am so mesmerized by your voice and just it takes me my brother so um he's actually on the team now he's on the roster he's going to try and and try his hand at black and gold long snapping here and either this coming fall or uh, a fall soon to come and uh he listened to your podcast before we hit the record button he listened to your podcast with coach Ferentz the other day and he texted me and he said um he said, Gary Dolphin's voice just takes me right back to football season. And I, <laughs> and I, and I, and I told him, well, it just so happens to be coming on the podcast on Sunday. He, he responded, well, damn, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and I was like, that is pretty cool. So I know, I know he's coming in to compete uh, and, you know, he's got big shoes, big spikes to fill uh, where you're concerned, uh, Tyler, but also the history of long snappers uh, at Iowa. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I tell him I'm uh, well. I'll, I'll get to see him uh, this, this hopefully later this summer and fall, and I'll thank him for the compliment. Uh, you know, I, I get asked a lot about, uh, you know, is that is that really Ronnie radio voice or is that is that always been you? I said, well, honestly, uh, you know, an old journalism professor told me the more you use it, uh, the more you refine the voice, the pipes, and I've been at it for 45 years now, and and, and the voice isn't getting any stronger. It's starting to the vocal cords are starting to weaken a little bit as I age, but we can still, you know, pump in enough coffee in the morning to <laughs> voice last most of the day. And then by the time we get to cocktail hour, we can, we can lubricate it up a little bit more with Pope there you go. Bobby Hanson. Uh, within reason, of course, now, of course, okay, but as sure. you know, uh, you got to pace yourself. You guys know that, but it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it isn't a voice that I had, uh, you know, through junior high, high school and, and post high school. But uh, once I get into broadcasting, and, and obviously I try to take care of the voice, and, uh, it, it, uh, but I, I am noticing uh, now on top of uh, 13 football games, because we all know we're, the Hawks are going to a bowl every year. Oh, for sure. Every year. <laughs> there's uh, on average 30 to 35 basketball games that we roll right into. So by the time we get to this point of the spring, uh, yeah, the voice is a little bit worn out. But, uh, you know, I'll keep, I'll keep doing it as long as I keep taking care of the voice. And, Iowa will have me. Uh, it's, it's a great job. It's uh, every kid that uh, grew up in Iowa or, you know, grew up in the Midwest that aspired to be uh, in journalism or broadcasting, uh, who wouldn't want to uh, uh, do football and or basketball for a Big Ten university. And of course, Iowa is unique, as you guys know, being in a rural state, essentially. Uh, everybody lives around their radio, whether it's in the farm, whether it's uh, in the driveway, uh, washing their car on Saturday afternoon listening to Hawkeye football or uh, 
or go, heading to the shopping center or blasting down I-80 or I-35. Uh, it's a labor of love. Iowa, I've always felt, has been not only a radio state, but an AM radio state. You guys are young, but you you know full well uh, what the WHOs and the WMTs oh, yeah. and the WOCs, where Ronald Reagan got his start, uh, oh, yeah. uh, mean to this state. And, uh, yeah, it's FM. It's all about XM. It's all about uh, the Internet. Now I get that. But there's not a place you can't go in the world where you can't hear Hawkeye football. And, you know, what always has impressed me the most, other than the guys that I've uh, gotten to cover, is who we hear from. And, and uh, maybe one of the most uh, emotional notes we got uh, was from uh, GIs uh, back in uh, Desert Storm who were, they had the radio turned down so low because they were fearful of being under a mortar attack at three in the morning. It was yeah. noon in Iowa City and they were listening to Hawkeye football. That that was their pacifier. Dang, uh, that's an incredible can you imagine story. That? Yeah. That's what were you going to say? <laughs> that's just an insane story is what he oh said. yeah yeah well, i tell you that's uh, and, and these guys uh well, a couple of them were from iowa and they said they uh, they apologized right up front because they said they had some uh, uh louisiana natives lsu tiger uh, bengal tiger fans in the in the tent with them listening in but just to hear <laughs> they just wanted to hear a, a college football game uh, and and that that uh drove home to me just uh, how impactful and how powerful uh uh the Hawkeye radio network can be on a Saturday afternoon or, or deep into the winter on a Wednesday night when we're, you know, bouncing the basketball at Purdue or at home with Ohio state. It's uh, the big 10 is the best as you guys know. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Sure. I, so when did you know that you want to get into broadcasting? Then? My senior year in high school, um, you know, I grew up in Cascade, which at the time was a town of about 1200 people in, in uh, Northeast Iowa, but 25 miles from Dubuque, not too far from Chicago where you grew up, Kevin, but, Mm -hmm. I, uh, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I enjoyed uh, uh, writing. I enjoyed the literature, the arts. Um, I, I obviously performed uh, in high school sports, but knew I wasn't good enough to go on and, and compete as a Division One athlete or really as a college athlete. I just didn't have the skill set uh, that, that's required. And, and so my guidance count. What's that? <laughs> yeah, we, I was going to say, we, we we really, you're looking well, at – you're looking at three college athletes who are. You guys can identify with that a little bit. Is that oh, what you're yeah. Do you you're know the, uh, the, the the saying "fake it till you make it"? Well, <laughs> I, we we did half of that. We never really made it though. Well, <laughs> it, it in my opinion, that you did. Uh, not everybody can long snap. Uh, not everybody can uh, can bulldoze and block from a fullback perspective. Nor can everybody fly down the field and be a kamikaze pilot on special teams. So you guys all had special skills and talents. And, I know I made that sound like an Academy <laughs> Award winning uh, line, but uh, you really did. Yeah, basically, so I, basically, yeah, we were we were good at being cannon fodder. <laughs> cannon fodder. Uh, well, you know what? It, it got you. Uh, it got you some college uh, educational tuitional aid, and that's yeah, all. That did, Eventually, right. we'll, we'll take it. It's a good. Uh, yeah. It was a good exchange. I'll, and you, I'll, and you I'll had four, four, four plus five, five, four plus maybe five years. Uh, in one of the great communities in America, in Iowa City, uh, as you guys know, it's uh, it's a great place to uh, grow up in college. Uh, not that you ever do, but my uh, <laughs> my guidance counselor said, "Hey, what do you want to do with your life once you leave uh, a little Catholic high school in Cascade, Iowa?" I said, "Well, I really don't know." He said, "Well, what do you like to do?" I said, "Well, I enjoy listening to the radio. My parents had given me a little spin dial transistor radio, and frankly, I fell in love with uh, those late summer nights where you could." you know, hop into bed as a 10 year old and go around the country and pick up all the great 50,000 watt clear channel stations, most notably WGN carried the Cubs and Camo X in St. Louis, the Cardinals and W uh, W uh, J R in Detroit had the Tigers and you could Cleveland. I mean, Cleveland, I could go on. And, and when I, when I was 10, the furthest Western, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say that because the Giants and the Dodgers were just getting going in California. But essentially, uh, Mickey Mantle told me one time in an interview, he grew up a St. Louis Cardinal fan because he listened to KMOX all the time growing up in Oklahoma. And when he was growing up back in the 40s, the only the only major league team uh, west of the Mississippi or on the Mississippi River was was the St. Louis Cardinals. You think about that and how far baseball and sports in general have come since the 1960s. And so that's kind of how I got hooked on radio. I love baseball. I grew up uh, uh, a baseball fan, loved to play baseball. Cascade, uh, Little Cascade, Iowa was a great baseball uh, community. Their high yeah. school team is in the state tournament typically every year. 
And so Dubuque County, uh, you know, home of the field of dreams, it's, it's a great baseball County. So that kind of got me going in, in radio. I ended up in Minneapolis going to school there. No, not the university of Minnesota. You guys will be happy to know that, <laughs> uh, but I went to a two year, uh, uh, vocational technical broadcast journalism school and then ended up at, uh, Loris College uh, in Dubuque, and and so that's kind of how I got going. My first job in radio was in Little Jacksonville, Illinois, down by Springfield. Kind of bounced around the Midwest uh, from there. A number of jobs. Uh, got back in Iowa in the seventies. Was, it, uh, was it always sports, or were, were you? Did they have you doing? No, I, I after six years in radio, uh, I went to TV for ten years. Wow. Started out as a news anchor. And by then I was married. We had a little, uh, a little boy and, and, you know, the money and, and radio just it, it, to this point, to this day, it's not the best. I mean, yeah. to, you stick with it. You can rise through the ranks. If you get lucky enough, you get to a point in your career where you're making good money. But television was where it was at then. This was in the late 70s, uh, mid 80s. And I continue to cover Iowa football, but I, I was a news anchor starting. And then uh, uh, ultimately, after about three years, got into uh, the sports anchor position, uh, got back into radio in the late eighties, uh, because a buddy of mine who, uh, who attended Loris college graduated from Loris and had gotten an associate AD job at Northwestern university. They needed a play by play guy in Evanston. And so I went there for six years, was working for the bears behind the scenes and television production at the time, kind of, to, uh, uh, kind of a dual, uh, job or a dual career in Chicago. And then in 1996, um, uh, Iowa called and said, hey, we're, we're curious uh, why you haven't applied for the Iowa job. I said, well, you know what, I, I, I understand the politics of Iowa. And at that point, as you guys wouldn't remember, but they, were, they decided to go to an exclusive rights holder, which ultimately was Learfield. But they had the three legends, uh, Ron Gonder, Bob Brooks, and Jim Zobel, all doing Iowa football. And I assume that uh, this is why you never assume anything, that they were going to give it to one of the three uh, guys that have been doing Iowa for 30, 40, 50, 60 years in Bob Brooks' case. And uh, as you guys know, uh, those were three institutions. And, and the committee said, nope, we, we decided we can't give it to one guy over the other. So we're going to hire a new play-by-play -play voice and keep Ed Podolak and Bobby Hansen. And as it turned out, it was uh, – a great move for me and a, and a great move uh, for, uh, for Iowa listeners because, of course, uh, and, I, and I preach this all the time, I don't know of another Division One play-by-play -play guy, a uh, play-by-play -play talent that has a Super Bowl champion for a football analyst and an NBA champion for a basketball analyst, and they were both great players at Iowa. So uh, I'm pretty fortunate. As I say, I try, to, I try to keep out of Podolak and Hanson's way. Just tee them up, let them comment, and then get back to the play-by-play. Makes yeah. it easy, huh? Well, That's how a legend was born. You mentioned well, you, you were on TV and uh, <laughs> doing the news anchor and stuff and whatever. I was the only thing I could think of my mind was Ron Burgundy. So yeah. where are you, Will Ferrell? <laughs> where are you that the talent that Ron Burgundy was as a news anchor? I didn't have the mustache or the goatee uh, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, Burgundy had. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've laughed at that movie uh, quite a bit, uh, Drake. It's a shame that number two sucked so bad because number one was one of the best movies ever. Well, it, it, it's, uh, there's an old adage that, uh, you know, a lot of the great movie stars will not do a sequel. Yeah. Uh, you know, that always shocked me uh, how Stallone, how many Rockies did he do? Six? Five or six? I think it was seven. It was seven yeah. now. Well, eight if seven? you count the creeds. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that thing really lost steam after maybe the second or third one. But, uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, you're right. Um, but, you know, I will say this. Uh, I, I did have, I do own a couple of leisure suits that uh, Ron Burgundy uh, showed in that movie, <laughs> at, least, at least of the same color. You know, the teal, the teal, oh, green, yeah. oh, yeah. golf just... aqua blue. <laughs> Listen, yeah, if, you went out in, if you went out in an aqua blue suit with some Sex Panther cologne, you would be batting <laughs> Hall of Fame numbers, though. Sex Panther cologne. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice if we did a TV show with uh, that outfit on, Travolta? That would, <laughs> that would be, be fantastic. Yeah. Let's set it up. Sex um, and Heels, yeah. So you mentioned through that story that kind of in the mid-90s there, um, the, the Iowa job kind of opened up, and, and that's where you got the – and so thankful that you did because the last 20 years of Hawkeye sports have just been, I, I, I don't think there's anyone who wouldn't associate 
Hawkeye Sports with you. It, it's been a perfect fit, um, I think. And like you said, a lot of that is luck, but I think that's kind of what life is a lot of the times. There was a, we, we did a little bit of research on your Wikipedia page just to come up with a few questions. Sure. Uh, and uh, it said in there that, you know, you mentioned you were working with the Bears behind the scenes, kind of grinding it out, doing whatever you could to help. And yeah. it said that um, you, there's actually a Bears announcing job that came open and it was between you and another guy and they went with another guy. And then he decided that he didn't want to do it two years later. And when they came back to you trying to get you to come and do the job, you were already stuck in Iowa City. Well, that, that's not totally accurate, uh, Tyler. And, and I've been asked that before, you know, and, and full confession. Uh, when I was uh, working for the Bears, I, I, I worked for the Bears from 89 to 99. And when Wayne Larravee left to go to the uh, uh, Green Bay Packers, uh, uh, by the way, Wayne is still there, great guy. Uh, and and uh, I was approached about I- interest in the position, and by this time I had already had the Iowa job, mm-hmm. and uh, so I I uh, I said, well, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll certainly interview for it, because you know you never shut that door. It didn't right. mean I was going to take the job, and I only had been on uh, the, the the scene in Iowa City for a couple of years. Uh, went to I think it was uh, I think WGN was the rights holder or WBBM, one of those great uh, radio stations in Chicago. Went in, uh, had, had a good interview. Uh, they called back and said, uh, well, uh, we really are impressed with what we've heard. Uh, we, we, we like the way, you, we like your style. We think you could get along with, who, I can't remember who the analyst was uh, at that point. I think it was, uh, I think it was, uh, well, I don't want to say, I'm not sure who it was. But uh, we, the only thing we need you to do is give up Iowa basketball. And, and that just floored me. And I said, well, um, I, you know, why do I need to give up Iowa basketball? Wayne Larrabee uh, continued to do uh, ESPN college football and college basketball, and he never he never uh, gave up their bear play by play, uh, and and uh, they they kept pushing for that. Ultimately, uh, I learned that they wanted me. It was WBBM now that I remember because they wanted me to come to Chicago, uh, hire on at BBM full time, and do their afternoon drive sportscasts. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I knew there had to be an undertow there somewhere. I said, you know what, guys? I said I've I've done that. I did that for almost twenty five years uh, anchoring sportscasts. I said I, I don't want to go back to that. I, I'm a play by play guy. I enjoy and love play by play. Uh, the live action, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't accept that. And so ultimately we went back and forth a couple times and, uh, you know, it was going to be too about a, about a 20, I guess a 20, $25,000 pay cut mm-hmm. because with the NFL or with the bears, you'd be talking 20 football games, 16 regular season four exhibition. Well, with Iowa, you've got thir- at least 13 football games and close to 30, hopefully 35 basketball games. But, you know, the, the economics uh, didn't drive the decision. Sure. I just wasn't prepared to go to Chicago and try to pay, you know, I probably have to live downtown with a family. Yep. I have to pay the cost of living in downtown Chicago versus <laughs> 20 miles or 15 miles west of Dubuque. So a lot of factors um, entered into it, but uh, somewhere, I think, in that Wikipedia page, they, they said I was offered the Bear play-by-play job. That, that was never the case. It was, I think, going to be offered to me had I given up Iowa basketball, and I'm a hawk. That's the bottom line. And I said, look, if I have to hire a pilot to get to <laughs> Chicago from Iowa City on a Saturday afternoon, if you're that concerned about it, I'll do it. Uh, but but there's no it's not necessary for me to to give up Iowa basketball and they said well let's agree to keep the door open you know that's one of the great lines uh, oh yeah uh, in in uh, in in job hiring as well look we'll we'll agree to get to keep, leave the door open and get back to you hope maybe someday down the road and I didn't figure that day was ever going to come and it, and it hasn't but uh, I, I appreciate the Bears I uh, the Bears uh, if the chance to work for an NFL organization uh, as you guys know is pretty special but uh I'm, I'm happy right where i'm at yeah we went uh we went over three in our, <laughs> in our <interviews. laughs> we were trying so hard to work for nfl organizations <laughs> <laughs> are you guys serious now yeah, yeah. Serious. I mean, we, we were pro day and everything you know oh, oh you're talking about as a player okay yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe they called you on the broadcasting side i'm sorry no, I no. Stood you. no uh, like we anyone said. who ever gets a hold of our broadcast is gonna immediately write across our name off the list. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be happy to know i talked to casey Kreider uh, a couple weeks back uh have you ever had casey on your show 
Not yet. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, but he's on the list. He's, yeah, he's, he's on the list. Great guy. And, you know, he grew up like you guys grew up in Iowa football. And, uh, special teams are special. I've always said that at Iowa because of the personalities that, that we've had. Uh, and uh, you three are uh, three of the more unique personalities that I've had. <laughs> But that you actually, come from great. You come from great families. That's that's the bottom line. Yeah, that's actually one of the funny things that when we were talking about this podcast, Drake brought up is uh, he said the only thing that he wanted to know is what you thought of him as a player <laughs> while we were still playing for the Hawks. Kulik. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, I mean, I, I was reviewing. Uh, I, we're, we're putting up Hawkeye classics uh, now to run on affiliates that will carry them. And uh, not all of them can because of, of their programming. But uh, uh, so the other day we did the 2015 Iowa, or excuse me, uh, the 2017 Iowa Ohio State game. Yep. Oh, there you go. And <laughs> Kulik, Kulik had a touchdown in that game. He sure did. I think that gets lost. I mean, and who, who the no, hell he, is he, he no sure. fan? Who, who the hell's Hawkinson and Fant? Yeah, Did Kulik score a touchdown? Come on. Who cares if Amani Hooker picked off the first pass, <laughs> the first play of the game? Uh, no, it's, uh, you guys all, uh, created special memories, uh, as, as, as a, you know, big picture, part of some great Iowa teams. And for that, you should be eternally proud and, and, uh, we're eternally grateful. I can tell you, uh, I think, uh, Kulik, didn't you make a big play at the, uh, at the pinstripe bowl too, as I remember? I did score a touchdown in that game yeah. too. <laughs> I didn't have to do much work. Did, uh, did weeding is weeding, does weeding still talk to you? Uh, because you know, he had yeah. that great play yeah, on the ball. Oh, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> remember got, that? That got him a first down. We were able to run clock, burn some timeouts. And, and oh, by the way, Kulik burrows in for a touchdown. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> I was just happy that game got over as fast as it did. Because yeah. Same. I remember, I blew my knee out on the black ice about 10 days prior to that. I was in absolute agony because the only, the only frickin' press box in Yankee Stadium was behind that goal post that yep. you guys attacked there in the end. And the north wind was coming right out of that and blowing right. And there's no heaters. It's a major oh, league baseball geez. stadium. So, uh, you know, I'm not looking for sympathy here. But uh, I was glad uh, Weeding made the great catch and first down. And, and then Kulik steals the thunder away from him by <laughs> burrowing in for the touchdown. Uh, anyway, you, you were not the – you were not the only one hoping for that game to end there, Dolph. There was there were some players struggling on the field. I, I heard every fan that ever went to that game say that like, that was the most miserable game that they've ever been to. So you went along. It, it's one of the great bowls because uh, you've got New Era and you've got the Yankees and you've got the city of New York. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, I'm not uh, uh, in a position to accept any swag like the players. But <laughs> a lot of the players off that team uh, that that particular year told me that uh, it, it's absolutely the best in terms of how they take care of you. Uh, oh, now, the football they, game was brutal. You're right. Yeah. Weather wise. But you guys would agree then that the, it was really a first class event. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They had like the Yankees personnel that take care of us really well. Um yeah, I'd 100% agree with that. They, they ran that bowl really well. And I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but uh, the people that run the bowl, uh, we were at a, a cocktail party one, one of the nights there uh, in the, uh, in the uh, media room, and uh, the Pinstripe Bowl officials said that uh, without question, the Hawkeyes, the team, the players, the support staff, the coaches were the most uh, – uh, courteous, well-behaved group that they they had encountered in, I don't know how many pinstripe bowls there have been, maybe eight or ten, but I'm thinking, damn, we're, we're, was, is Kulik and Kluver and Ward, are they on the trip? <laughs> well <-behaved. laughs> no, we, we didn't. Guys. We weren't there. We Loose showed up on Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, that's that's got to make Coach Ferris feel awesome, but it also makes me wonder, like, what are these other teams doing on this bowl trip? Because we're nothing special. <laughs> Although, yeah, yeah Coach Ferentz would often say and, and report back to us, and, and Fed would come to us too and, and often say that places would give us, like, the, the five-star review with how we treated them and all that. And I'm with you, Kev. I don't know what the other teams do that, that we simply didn't do disrespectfully, but we were just – doing our thing and people seem to like when we came places so i've heard that from a number of bowls uh and i've been to well since 1997 i've been to uh 
been to everyone. I think it's 18 bowls now or 17, something like that. And, and uh, I've, uh, particularly the Outback Bowl people, they love Iowa. Yeah, they do. Uh, the, uh, the Holiday Bowl uh, was very, very complimentary. You know, as you guys know, a lot of it has to do with the fans and the number of fans that, yeah. that make, mm -hmm. make those trips that intermingle with the players. And I think, you know, courtesy is, is the word that comes to mind. I mean, who doesn't like to get a little wild and, and unruly uh, if you're a player at a bowl game, you know, out of the sight of the uh, TV cameras? and the yeah. media but i mean that that's what you're there for to have fun on the beach or you know have fun uh, in new york city or or uh, wherever you happen to be and so i think a lot of it when you look at uh, the team the coaches uh the the crush of iowa fans who who use bowl trips as family vacations uh, every december and january yeah. i think that really is impressive to the bulls and, and the more you go back to bowls like the like the outback or a couple times we've been to the orange bowl the bcs bowl and you know, even I heard in Indianapolis at the at the Big Ten championship game, which mm. might have been drink the, the bars game. dry, baby. Oh my God, <laughs> the uh, the uh, bartender at our hotel, the team hotel, said they had never run out of beer twice. <laughs> he said, and we've hosted the Super Bowl, we've hosted NCAA Final Fours, but uh, uh, three times they had the Budweiser semi pull up in the alley behind the hotel just to unload more Budweiser and Bud Light and, and other beverages too. But I, I think it's just a, a well-controlled party atmosphere that Iowa brings, uh, and obviously the economic impact is incredible. Yeah, it's huge. It is. And then, you know, that, that alone story right there makes me love Iowa fans more than anyone else in the world. In fact, that we just go into a city animals. and drink all their beer. Like, not, <laughs> not a drop left in the city. If hey, you, in heaven if there is no play, beer. What's that, Drake? In heaven, there is no beer. There is. That's why we drink it here. That's right. If you, uh, I mean, if you guys, you know, I, I have the pleasure and, and the privilege of being around the players, uh, as well as the fans. And we had, uh, I don't know how many how many Hawk fans we had at the huddle uh, out in San Diego. I think the, uh, uh, the the Hyatt Convention Center there holds about five six thousand. Well, it was packed. And a lot of the same people that we, we see uh, uh, year after year after year, whether it's East Coast, West Coast, uh, Miami, or wherever. And, and one of the comments they make uh, consistently is how accessible the players are, not only at the bowl game, but uh, throughout the season, and how they get to know your parents and your families. And, and uh, it, it's, it's heartfelt. It's, it's, uh, it's genuine. And I, I think, you know, in Iowa, we pride ourselves on being genuine, whether you're a player a fan, a coach, uh, or an administrator. And, and I think that's what uh, uh, has people scratching their heads when we leave their communities. Yeah, I, I agree. I was going to bring it back to, uh, to Coach Ferentz. Uh, you know, you kind of – the rest of the ship follows the – what's the captain? Th yeah, the, the captain. The guy at the wheel? The yeah, guy the at guy. the stern wheeler? Yeah. yeah, and, uh, and we, we got a pretty good captain steering our ship. So uh, – you do, I'm, and you'd also have to face Doyle too if you get sideways. And, and that, that yeah, would not be you don't you don't want to do that. Uh, facing <laughs> Doyle, facing Doyle in a negative way is never something you're going to win. So yes, the associate head coach, as I like to call him. Have you ever seen anybody in a program who's not the head coach as powerful as Doyle? Just being that you've got had to have been a football fan for your whole life and everything, like. Has there ever been anybody in college who you, who you know was just 1A to the head coach? But not, not anybody I've known. I mean, I'm sure uh, – I don't know who Nick Saban's, uh, you know, closest confidant is. But I think every college coach has that. But, but none, uh, you know, maybe with the title of strength and conditioning coach. <laughs> and, and Doyle – now, now, he is a terrific football mind, as you guys know, too. Yeah. Uh, but nobody mm -hmm. studies how to build a football body like, like this guy. And, and uh, he certainly – if you're the best-known strength and conditioning coach in college football, that says a lot. And, and I think Chris is by far. Uh, and he's uh, – meaning he's got the respect, uh, the way he handles himself uh, in public and uh, in private. I'm, I'm telling you uh, – <laughs> I was never so impressed with an Iowa football team as I was in Ames uh, last September through what, what we have three, four, five, six hours of delays. Yeah. I felt like Harry Carey at, at Wrigley field in a rain delay. <laughs> well, Stoney, you know, let's fill, fill another hour. And, and we finally went to the Kirk Ferentz show that week, but the uh, student body, the Hawks had to walk 
right out in front of the student body. You guys been to uh, <laughs> We remember. Yeah, Christ, it's, you know. it's one of the yeah. best walks there is. It that was, is honestly was the brutal. second best walk right past, uh, <laughs> right behind Kinnick. It was it, it, brutal. We could hear some of the uh, slang and uh, <laughs> profanity being tossed. Uh, the player and, and Doyle was leading the pack, and every player was looking straight at Doyle's shaved head. And they did <laughs> now, a lesser team, as you guys know, would turn and either flip the bird or they'd mouth a, a, a nasty, and not, not none of that. And you know, Doyle had got, got in their face before they exited the tunnel, and, and you know, that came from Ferentz too. And, and, and so they knew what to expect, so they handled it so well and professionally, and then uh, obviously uh, did, their, did their talking on the field, which uh, uh, I can tell you was uh, very uh, gratifying uh, in the end. Yeah, Dolph, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but uh, as, you, as we were driving in to Jack Trice, there were so many people flipping us off that there was from like the ages – six years old all the way up to people in like wheelchairs with oxygen tanks Absolutely. And everybody is just showing you both middle fingers it's pretty sick <laughs> I, I think, think it's an enjoyable experience I, I think it speaks volumes for the for the rivalry itself uh and, and and hey look i'm not saying when when the cyclones roll up in front of kinnick stadium uh, there isn't uh, there isn't some gesturing going on <laughs> to them as well but i i don't know maybe it's just because we we uh we were there so early and, and uh, I, I've been to Ames many, many times and called mostly victories. I'm happy to say, but I, I don't ever remember it being that, that nasty uh, as it was that day. And, you know, I, I think it speaks uh, to what Matt Campbell has done. He's got that fan base fired up, but uh, you know, to me, you got to be respectful of your opponent yeah. uh, to a certain degree. And, and uh, unfortunately it was, it, it, it got out of hand early and, and it was, uh, per, uh, you know, permeated throughout the afternoon. And then the rain delays and the lightning delays. I, I'm really shocked they got the game in. But uh, as we left in the, in the dark of night uh, from uh, Iowa State, and they were there early. As you remember, game day uh, was there, mm -hmm. I think, for the yep. first time. Yep. But uh, as long as the Hawks uh, are on the right side of the scoreboard, uh, I'm happy. Uh, as are we. As are we. <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember the first time in 2013 um, when we went over to Iowa State. You two wouldn't have been there, but um, we walked out. I was there. I was in the stands, but I was there. Oh, okay. Well, as we walked out, we go down the side of that building. And uh, so, obviously, first time. And Doyle just said he, it, was, it was exactly that. Before we walked out, he's like, got, he's like, got in his way, way more intimidating and respect. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he goes, guys, there's going to be a lot of shit on the other side of that fence. This is a business trip. They wish they were on your side of the fence. Eyes forward, let's go to work. And I was like, I could have ran through 12 brick walls at that point. I was <laughs> How so could you not be fired up with that short, terse uh, line from uh, Chris Doyle? Uh, he always finds the right words. And it, similar to you, you two are very similar, and Coach Ferentz. It just seemed like, man, he always knew what to say. And uh, – it was that Iowa State environment is something else. So I, I can't imagine with the rowdiness of the weather this year and, and all that. Well, you guys also know that uh, there are uh, certain environments in the Big Ten that, uh, that, that maybe aren't Ames, but they come close. And Doyle always seems to have everybody well grounded. You know, he's a, he's a huge Red Sox fan, and I'm a huge, no, we know. huge we Yankees know. fan. So he and I are, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, barbs we can throw back and forth, uh, as I call them, the cheating Red Sox now. Uh, he doesn't like that very well, but, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of fun and he knows how to be good natured and he knows how to be serious when, when, when he's supposed to be. And I don't know, is that, uh, is that environment, uh, uh, the nastiest you guys uh, have been in? I, you know, I, I get asked a lot, you know, what's your favorite stadiums to call, uh, games. in? I said, well, you mean on the road? Yeah. On the road. I, other I said, cause Kinnick's the best. The best, obviously. It's not even close. I mean, the horseshoe to me is, is uh, I usually go, I'm, I'm a crowd noise guy. If you guys know, I can't get that headset up turned high enough on game day because I thrive <laughs> off crowd noise, especially in Iowa City. But Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the horseshoe is unique and that with that cantilever, and, and oh, by the way, 115,000 people in the stadium, that noise goes straight up, hits that underneath, that undercarriage of the, of the top of the stadium and 
and hurdles back down right on top of you. And it's, uh, I'm delighted we're going back to uh, Columbus this year for the first time in a while. Since the first uh, time since I uh, made the body bags quote. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I forgot dude. about that. Yeah, that's, that's definitely going to. I've had this date bulletin somewhere. Yeah, I. It's been on my bulletin board since I made that quote. I was like, can't what wait. Year, what year was that? When was that? That was in seventeen. That was seventeen. That was seventeen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. You don't. You think they're. You think they're going to be laying in the weight? Uh, the only <laughs> difference is Urban. Urban isn't there. The worst defeat in the history of uh, or in uh, Urban Myers. Uh, college football career uh, that that has been played up a lot but hey you know what uh, Hawks will show up I I, I like as you guys know I, I like uh, I like what I see every year in Iowa football but but especially uh, coming up this year Iowa is going to be be the hunted but they lost a lot of good players you know at key positions uh, from last year's team most notably Chandler and but I've watched Petrus throw the ball and I mean he doesn't even have to cock that arm full full load he, he that ball's out he just snaps it i don't know if that's just a byproduct of growing up on the west coast but uh spencer and and, and you you guys know uh, if your quarterback's got his head screwed down straight then you got a chance and mm -hmm. and, and he's uh, he's got a personality uh he, he certainly has the arm but we just haven't seen him in action nor has ohio state so it's going to be fun going into a going into the horseshoe unfortunately yeah. Kevin didn't get to play in the horseshoe yeah, so we played in the Big Ten for five years, and we didn't get to play in, like, two of the most iconic stadiums, being the Horseshoe and the Big House. Those are the only two, too. I, I, you, you did not play in Ann Arbor? I forgot no, about that. I never that. played in Ann Arbor either. played in Ann Arbor. Well, yeah. I know it's been a long time since we played in, uh, in, in, in Ohio Stadium. I think it was uh, – was it 2013? Yeah. yeah, we didn't uh, – Kluver got to go, me and Drake. We were uh, sitting in our dorm room. Yeah, that's With, uh, yeah. <laughs> my my locker was uh, yeah. My my locker in the in the horseshoe was the corner with a bench that they found uh, I think in the storage closet. So <laughs> every you didn't get single, slivers, did you? Uh, we took we took sixty eight or sixty nine guys on that trip, and all but one had an actual locker, and that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an old stadium. Now they they did a three hundred million dollar renovation. On uh, on the horseshoe, you think they would have uh, addressed the visiting locker room, wouldn't well, you? A little bit. Yeah, it was it was okay. I I was feeling pretty yeah. wide eyed at, at, anyway to be there and to go out and warm up against. Uh, oh, what was his name? The quarterback when Braxton, Braxton. Braxton and and Mark Mark uh, Carlos Hyde. Carlos Hyde. Yeah, Ooh, they had some dogs on that team. That's, that's a pretty sure. good one-two punch there. Let me yeah. tell you. Kreider and I were snapping at midfield, and uh, he jumped in front of Kreider, uh, Braxton Miller did, and was trying to take punt snaps, like, as he was just joking around. And I was, like, mortified as a 18-year-old <laughs> kid. I was like, is this really happening right now? Like, I'm just – Did you call him out? No, Casey was yelling at him to move because Casey, you know, is always vocal. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. But, he just uh, snapped it out of his head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bounced it right off his cage, you know. That's, yeah, uh, there you go. That's one of the great Hayden Fry stories of all time. I don't know if you guys ever heard this one where uh, uh, Iowa shut out Michigan 28 to nothing. Mo Schembechler was the head coach, and he had uh, – Kluver will really appreciate this. Uh, he had uh, – they were either top five ranked. I mean, they, they were either two, three, or four. Hawks were, I think, top ten or top 15. It's at Kinnick Stadium, and Hayden sends out a guard – I can't remember, who's never snapped a football in his life. And he's snapping it over the punt, punt practice before the game. He's snapping it over the punter's head. He's snapping it wide right. He's rolling it back there. And Fry is standing at midfield. And Bo comes out and he goes, Fry, what the hell? What's going on? What's, what's wrong with your, uh, your long snapper? He, he hasn't hit the punter yet. And Hayden looked at him and said, well, Bo, we don't plan on punting today. <laughs> and Schembechler looked at him. He didn't know how to take it at first. Then he finally figured it out, and he called him a dirty, rotten SOB. <laughs> and uh, Iowa went out and just just stomped uh, an outstanding Michigan team. Shut him out, 28 to nothing. Wow. Uh, th that uh, That's one of my lasting memories of Iowa football. When I write my book, 
Uh, I'll probably have that that story in there, although it's been told many times. But that's a good story. Hmm. That is a great. Uh, story. I always appreciate good Hayden Fry story. I tell you what, uh, Fryisms they call them. Uh, uh, he 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 could fill a book just on uh, on his one liners, and most of them you guys have heard. But hey, I lived through the uh, well. I lived through most of the uh, as I like to call it, nineteen non winning seasons. I think there were two five hundred years in there. But as Jim Zobel uh, used to say, "What the hell is only two bad decades?" <laughs> and uh, Hayden came in in uh, seventy eight, seventy nine, and uh, a couple of years later had him in the Rose Bowl with Andre Tippett. Mark Bortz and some of those great players, Hap Peterson, and since uh, what '81, boys, uh, it's been it's been an incredible ride of Iowa football, and no signs of letting up anytime soon. Absolutely not. You've got you just mentioned you've got so much. You've got all this all these years that you've that you've covered. You've been around Iowa football. You've been announcing Iowa football. What are some of your your more favorite memories or, or favorite games that you've called some of your, some of the ones that really just stick out in your memory. Well, it, certainly one of them, and, and I, you couldn't pick one. Uh, I'll give you a couple. The first game I ever did uh, was uh, the 1997 opener. And Tim Dwight was on that team, a uh, consensus uh, preseason all America pick. Uh, and uh, uh, Iowa had a, had a, had a good football team. They were, they were picked to uh, finish pretty high as I remember uh, uh, but the opening play of the game uh, they're playing Northern Iowa who by the way opens up the season this year in September against the Hawks so you and I Iowa wins a coin toss and you and I kicks off and a nice return by Dwight as you can imagine he always brought it out 20 30 yards this particular uh, opening day in September and it, it was hot it was like uh, 88 degrees brings it out to the 44 yard line the Hawkeye 44 on the first play from scrimmage, uh, Tavian Banks goes off left tackle and goes uh, 56 yards for a touchdown. First play of my broadcast career, wow. uh, I'm trying to describe a 56-yard touchdown run. And he just, as you know, uh, if you guys know Tavian Banks, if he got to the second level, forget about it. Uh, he was off to the supermarket. And as he's crossing the goal line, uh, I yell, you can put it in the banks, Tavian Banks. Hey. <laughs> and that kind of uh, – now – there's no way I had that prepared or written down because I wasn't expecting uh, that for the first play of the game. But I, uh, I was thinking of, uh, of, uh, of a line I could use for Tavian because he was uh, heralded as a running back. Um, Iowa went to Michigan that year, the big house. Michigan was ranked number one. Uh, they had uh, Brian Greasy, I believe, was the quarterback. And uh, Lloyd Carr was the coach. And Iowa had Michigan down, I think it was 21-7 at the half really had him on the run and the Hawks ultimately lost the game 28, 24. Uh, Tim Dwight had, I think he had a punt return for a touchdown, a, uh, uh, a kick return for a touchdown. Uh, he, he was just a one man wrecking ball that day. And Iowa had a chance to win the game late and Michigan. I mean, they're ranked number one. They ultimately were undefeated, won the national championship that year. Iowa drives the ball down the field. Uh, as time is running out, the Hawks use up all their timeouts. And Matt Sherman was the quarterback for the Hawkeyes out of little St. Ansgar, Iowa. We didn't know it at the time, but his thumb, as he's following through with a pass early in the second half, his thumb uh, crashes off the helmet of Victor Hobbs, who was a first-team All-American linebacker for Michigan. So the, the kid was actually playing with four fingers, throwing the football the entire second half. And he throws a, a deep slant of maybe 24 yards to uh, Dwight, with, with less than 20 seconds to go, and the ball just spiraled right into the ground at Dwight's feet. Dwight had the guy beat, would have caught it for a game-winning touchdown, but Matt couldn't put any mustard on the ball, and they ran the clock out. Those, that, that's a vivid memory. Uh, I, I'm often asked, what's your favorite memory of Iowa football? And you would naturally think it's uh, Drew Tate to Warren Holloway in the would, Capital One Bowl. I was just going to ask. Yeah, that was, that's probably the most uh... – Often Maybe the most famous we, call. Yeah, exactly. But if you go back and listen to it, I, I'm I'm so PO'd that Iowa isn't calling a timeout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Podolak, Podolak's more the game livid. Is end on this play. Yeah, yeah. Podolak's more <laughs> livid than I am because we had two timeouts left, and we thought that Kenny O'Keefe had lost his mind <laughs> when, in fact, uh, Drew Tate had two plays coming out of the huddle. He knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, but so I was kind of stumbling as the play because you're not expecting – 
you only need a field goal to win now. Yeah. That was really irritating. <laughs> you only need a field goal to win, and I was driving the ball over the midfield stripe. And Tate pops that touchdown pass, and, you know, I'm crapping myself, <laughs> swallowed my tongue, and, and I had no idea who caught the pass because uh, Warren, you know, immediately goes to the ground. He's dogpiled on. Uh, I was impressed, more impressed by the uh, the block that Hinkle made on the outside uh, to uh, just chip the guy who would have tackled Warren inside the 10-yard line, and the game would have been over. Uh, but that that is a, a great, great game to call, trust me. But Because uh, Iowa led LSU all the way. They were the defending national champions. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had gone 13-0. and I mean, they had like four number one draft picks on that team, three of them on the defensive side of the football. But uh, the Saturday night uh, come from behind uh, kick-ass win over Michigan State in Ann Ar- uh, in uh, East Lansing. Michigan State had a great team. Oh, no. Colin, Colin Sandeman uh, from, uh, from, Bettendorf. from Bettendorf got laid out on a cheap-ass hit by their, their, uh, their thug safety or cornerback and, th- and then stood over him. And, and Colin is writhing – on the field. He's out cold and Stanzi comes to the rescue. And I, I don't know why we didn't have a fight uh, that night, but they call a, a targeting hit on Michigan state and a 15 plus a 15 yard unsportsmanlike conduct. So the Hawks get, uh, it, it, it wasn't 30 yards, uh, but it was about a 15 ended up being like a net 17 yard penalty. So Stanzi takes over uh, about the 45, about the Iowa 40, 45 yard line, no timeouts left. And you could just see fire in his eyes over the cheap shot on Sandeman. And he drives the Hawkeyes right down the field. And they break huddle. It's fourth and goal at the seven. No timeouts left. Uh, Iowa's down. Oh, by the way, Iowa's down five. So they need a touchdown to win the game. And they get it down. I think it was like six seconds to go. And Stanley backs up. And Mar- uh, Marvin McNutt, uh, who later said, I wanted that football thrown at me. With those big hands and those strong fingers. Marvin had single coverage. And he got drilled at the time, or right at the uh, the goal line, and fell into the end zone with a game-winning touchdown. And the Hawkeyes win it. Uh, I think it was 17-15 or 15-13, something like that. And of course, as you can imagine, Podolak and I are just crying in the press box. <laughs> We're so delighted, uh, first off, that Colin was going to be okay, but that Stanzi showed his true mettle. You know, he that guy would have to be ranked as one of the all-time great quarterbacks, clutch quarterbacks in Iowa football history. And the best part of the night was, uh, as you know, we always pick a star of the game. And uh, we picked Pat Anger because uh, they held a great Michigan State offense to 13 or 14 points. But you know how anger can be on the air. And so oh, as yeah. you, you can understand, the locker room was a mess. Everybody, you could hear all this screaming and jumping up and down. So we get through the interview, and, and I, I'm going to wrap it up. And I go, well, Pat. That just sounds like Christmas morning down there. D- describe that Iowa locker room for me right now, if you would. He goes, well, no, there's a lot of naked guys. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of naked guys walking around the locker room. And, and you know, I'm thinking a block ahead what he's going to say next. And I cut him. I said, okay, Pat, thanks, buddy. <laughs> I, I was waiting for the, you know, a couple of footlongs. Uh, <laughs> a couple of pendulums swinging here. Uh, I, I knew that with Podolak looks at me and, he was wide-eyed. He said, oh, buddy boy, let's get to a break. <laughs> and so that, that, that capped a great night uh, in East Lansing because, uh, you know, Michigan State, uh, you know what a rivalry that has become. And there, there's another team we haven't played in, in a few years, but we'll, we'll play them again this year. I think we get them back in Iowa City this fall. Yeah, I think you're right. That now, was stand out as the highlight, uh, you know, Iowa. Foot. I mean, there are many of them. Hard, hard to, you know, beat the pinstripe bowl. There's so many great bowl games, but. Uh, certainly, uh, that night in East Lansing will step uh, stand out for uh, for me for a long time. Did you have any favorite players that you like? I was about to ask the I, same I, question, yeah. Kevin. The I mean, exact same question. It always been a fun interview. Any favorite, favorite players? players to interview? Yeah. Well, Anger certainly would would yeah. uh, take take the cake. I mean, uh, you know, Claiborne uh, was always good uh, on the air, good for a, a laugh or two. Uh, most of them, you know, honestly, most of them came on the offensive or uh, defensive side of the football. Because the offensive guys, you know, they're 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 the cerebral ones. Now, I I will tell hey, you that. Uh, hey, easy yeah, with that. Real well, cerebral. they're they're bright guys. I'm not saying defensive guys aren't bright, but um, Anger, uh, Claiborne, uh, Colin Cole, going way back, was always a 
a great interview. You know, offensively, Stanzi is, is gifted. He's articulate. Drew Tate, Drew Tate was a hoot on the air. He's got that Texas uh, sense of humor. Did I ever have? Did we ever have you guys on a star of the game? Uh, no, or, no. You were no. talking to the washed up walkouts. Who like the stars of the game? Not a chance that uh, the long sa- – yeah, I, even if I scored the touchdown on the pull cat, I'm still not the star of that game. So, uh, yeah, Josh Jackson had four picks that game. Yeah. Well, we, have had, uh, we have had a few special teams players on uh, for the uniqueness of the special team calls uh, the last couple of years. Yeah. Of course, we've had uh, Duncan on a couple times. I well, think he have the best kicker in college football on. By far. Yeah. I mean, gee whiz. But, Talking of a talk about a guy who really performed in that Iowa State game when the weather. That was oh unbelievable. And you know he had a, he had a couple like that uh, uh, this year. Uh, you know our our goofball from uh, Clayton Ridge Guttenberg. We've had him on uh, uh, a time or two. Number seven. Yeah, I wish he would have thrown the pass a little bit further <laughs> out in front of me. <laughs> that that now if you're asking me about plays that stick out. Uh, that that one is uh, I remember vividly, and I was pulling so bad for you to. Uh, uh, well, you pulled or, you too know. hard, Dolph, and pulled yeah. the from underneath. <laughs> <laughs> to be that honest, ball. Dolph, it's way better for all of us that it didn't go well. You know what? I never thought about that, Drake. We've gotten to make fun of him for it a lot, and it's made for good content on the podcast. And then we don't have to know the long snapper that fucking scored the touchdown because that would be – un. It, we just couldn't live with that. I just figured he lied about his 40 time and, and just couldn't catch up with the football. Or it, it Actually, it fell short, didn't it? Yeah, it fell short. Yeah. I, uh, no, I never lied about my 40. I've always been slow. But um, I was – I take solace in the fact that uh, after, the, after the game, they asked Coach Ferentz about the play. They said um, – they asked if, if they were worried about my hands and me catching the ball on that play, and, and he very quickly um, responded, oh, I w- Kluver wasn't the one I was worried about in that. In- <laughs> so hey. he, also, he also told the, uh, told the public that when uh, we started in the program that everyone hated me. <laughs> Everybody hated you? You can find it on uh, – if you go to um, Kirk Ferentz, Ohio State postgame interview 2017 – You'll find it somewhere in there when they ask about the pull cat. He'll be like, you know, when Kluver got here, everyone hated him. <laughs> now, is that your I'm not going to lie, or, or what? what? What was it, Ward? What was it, Kevin? What, what, I, what was it? I, I just scrolled through his Instagram page before I ever met the kid, and I'm like, this guy's a douchebag. <laughs> what is <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Well, there you go, Tyler. And, yeah. you know, Gary, I, uh, I, there's, no, there's no refute for me. I, I, as a, I, I matured. Let's just say that. So you're saying when you were a pure freshman that you weren't uh, the most mature individual uh, coming into town. Well, you know, you are from Marshalltown, which is a great community. But, uh, Marshalltown. If there's uh, any place worse than Muscatine, it's Marshalltown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are cruel. Come on. We, we got two great affiliates in Marshalltown and, and, uh, and Muscatine. They do. They do. And uh, I know a lot of good people in both communities. And, That's the uh, truth. There are some great people in, in, in Muscatine. Yeah, and, and, and Marshalltown. See, I yeah. don't know Marshalltown. All I know is that when we went to Marshalltown, we dominated sw- state swim meets and we went home. So I, I don't know anything about the people. Yeah, Drake was a swimmer in high school. <clears throat> I didn't know that. Is that right? An All-American. So I was a swimmer growing up, and then I was a football player in high school, a real mediocre one. But then uh, our co- we had lost a couple of absolute animals, and the coach was like, hey, can you come back and swim the 50 for us? I was like, sure, I can do that. So I came back and sw- uh, swam my senior year, and we had our three-peat. So they had oh, worked right. without me. I read that in your bio. I just didn't believe you were a high school swimmer. I thought, yeah. well, it's got to be a misprint. Uh, <laughs> no, I was. Player, I was, a, I was tennis, swimmer, maybe. Sorry. Wrestler, maybe. But nope. not, not a swimmer. And, you know, when I, when I was a, a youngster and hooked on uh, high school basketball, uh, one of the all-time uh, Hall of Fame great coaches in Iowa high school history was uh, George Funk out of uh, Marshalltown. Yep. And what was that uh, – what what they call it over in Marshalltown? What was that gymnasium called? Uh, was it the Roundhouse? Or? The Roundhouse. The yeah, Roundhouse, sure. see? And uh, Marshalltown was winning state championships or competing for state championships on a regular basis. So. Every single year, yep. Yeah, great, great, great high school basketball. Uh, Newton had great teams that always seemed to beat Marshalltown out, but they had a guy named Buzz Levick who was coaching their program and George Funk. and Yeah, and Marshalltown's got a beautiful one. Now the tornado, it's great to see them bouncing back from the – 
devastation right. tornado because Marshalltown has one of the more prettier town squares with the courthouse right in the middle uh, that you'll see. In, I mean, that is so middle America. Oh, yeah. That's what's so great about growing up in Iowa. I'd, when I, you know, I get off asking, uh, asked often what I do in the off season. There isn't much of an off season for me because of the iClub banquet tour and mm -hmm. fundraisers. But uh, I love to drive the back roads of Iowa and, and travel through these small communities. And because you're, you're always going to see a Hawkeye neon sign at, at, oh, the, yeah. at the Main Street favorite bar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it could be called Herkies. It could, could be called... Uh, you know, Kevin's do drop in, but it, it's, uh, I'm going to start that. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, uh, there, there are a lot of do drop ins. I like that name, but it's, uh, it's a real joy to, cause I, I grew up in a town like that, you know, a lot smaller than Muscatine or Marshalltown and, and, uh, really enjoy, uh, the people are genuine. Uh, they're really down home and, and honest, good people. And, uh, you know, 99% of them are Hawk fans. So, you know, what are you going to do? You got to talk to the people that pay the prices, pay the tickets, uh, pay the ticket prices and buy the concessions and pay the parking. Uh, they're the true supporters of uh, Hawkeye athletics. And I know you guys are most appreciative of that. Iowa fans oh, are unmatched, literally unmatched. They are. I would agree. And uh, I, I want to bring it up because it, it kind of goes along with Iowa fans being unmatched. You had most of Iowa on your side last year when, uh, when we got, you made the joke uh, that we hadn't suspended you yet on the podcast. I want to get your thoughts on the way that the that the broadcasting with the Pat McAfee's of the world and uh, kind of new age younger guys, just the the evolution of of media and um, the fine line of of trying to stick to that old school kind of broadcasting that you're more used to, and also trying to bring that like modern hip um, stuff that Pat McAfee does. Um, What's it like to ride that line on air? And, uh, and what are your thoughts on, on political correctness and all that? Well, first off, uh, to the suspension itself, uh, I owned it. You know, I, I, uh, I, I made a mistake. I, I took some uh, sensitivity training uh, after uh, uh, the suspensions. I guess there were two of them. And, uh, you know, learned some valuable lessons. Uh, and, you know, I'm an, I'm an old horse. I've been doing this since 1971. You're still a stallion. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, you're a thoroughbred, yeah. Gary. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys' support. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I took a step back, obviously, during the suspension, really uh, examined and re-examined uh, my career uh, and, and uh, where I had been, what I had come from, and what I was in uh, 2019. And, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, two things. Uh, I, I didn't realize that uh, – that much had changed because, uh, you know, the second component there is understand that play by play is, is not a, a prepared script. No. I mean, you're calling it as you see it. You're, you're going off, uh, you know, what you've built uh, over your career. And at the same time, uh, play by play is two things. You want to be accurate uh, as accurate as you can, but you also want to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. And, and in radio, uh, you're creating a, a picture. And to me, uh, the uh, the iconic uh, images that I grew up with uh, in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, uh, the monster movies, uh, I've, I've drawn on, on uh, you know, cartoon characters. Uh, look at what we have today. We've got the Green Hornet. We've got the Avengers. We've got... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, all... And, and, and I've used them almost like a Rolodex, just in a rotating fashion. You know, a guy's got an S on his chest, Superman. And, uh, uh, but, but I learned that uh, no matter what you say, uh, with the internet now and social media and everything, you're scrutinized under a, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the spyglass. Yeah, yeah you, you're, everything is, is uh, taken apart what you say. Every broadcast is out there to listen to. And it wasn't the first time I screwed up. It just uh, somebody called me on it. A, a listener called me on it, or listeners. Uh, and uh, I hope I paid the price. At least I think I've paid the price. And I've I've had uh, you know a, a, a come to Jesus meeting with with the coaches, with the players involved. Sent letters of apology. Uh, talked to the uh, opposing head coach. Uh, and uh, we're all good. And, and uh, you know, you, 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 you forgive if somebody made a mistake. At least I hope so. But your, 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 uh, 
pinnacle point, uh, Tyler, is there, there's no question that uh, the Iowa fans uh, uh, ultimately uh, were there for me um, over not just a week or two, but many months. Uh, and, and I want to throw uh, folks like yourself in there. The, uh, I don't know how many players and coaches, former players and coaches that I heard from uh, that were supportive. And, uh, you know, full confession, there were a couple that said, hey, uh, you know, you just can't say that or you can't use that description. Sure. I go, hey, I get it. I get it. I, I want to keep everybody happy. Uh, you know, the bottom line is uh, uh, that the Iowa fan base <clears> – <throat> was just incredible in their support. And, and they let the university know it. Not that that was going to change anything, but it certainly uh, uh, told me that, uh, okay, uh, you know, I screwed up. I made a mistake. I goofed up. But I'm not a bad person, uh, person and I'm sure as hell not a racist. That was the thing that hurt the most, it, it, that somebody would even insinuate uh, that there was a, 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 a tinge of racism uh, into either event, uh, into, in, into either calling. But uh, some people felt that way. And, and, uh, and once I re-examined it, I go, okay, uh, you, you know in your heart you're not a racist, but you know what? you got to correct some things. you gotta, mm -hmm. you got to take some steps to be better and be more cognizant of, of what is hurtful. And, uh, you know, I wasn't the first one to, to, to trip over that line, and I probably won't be the last. So here we are. We're back uh, uh, doing what I love to do best, and that is uh, in the broadcast booth or, uh, you know, courtside uh, on game night, and hopefully for a few more years. Absolutely. I, I, I was uh, pretty vocal in my support of you, Dolph. We went to war for you on this podcast. All three of us did. I know, I know you guys did. I've heard we it. We thought it was bullshit lines. for sure, but, uh, you know. It is hey, what it is. We got past it. Greg, uh, you know that uh, uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate the fans, obviously, but uh, I, there's nobody I appreciate more than the athlete and certainly the ones I've covered and tried to be fair and accurate with over the years. And, you know, we still get criticized, Eddie and I do in the booth, uh, or Bobby and I uh, on game night, uh, because people think that we're, we're overly critical of a performance. And you know, I've gone back. I don't listen to every broadcast, but I, I sure as heck listen to a lot of them. And uh, typically, those games have ended with a 25-point loss or four turnovers. Uh, and sometimes people uh, need to listen close and, and understand that uh, I, I, at least not to my knowledge, have ever gotten personal with an athlete on the air. Uh, Drake Kulik or Kevin Ward or Tyler Kluver or Gary Dolphin may have a bad game, and we may point out that, you know, the offense didn't have it today or they weren't clicking. But uh, if, I, if I ever accuse a young guy or a young lady, an athlete, uh, critically and personally, then I don't deserve to be uh, standing there with a headset on. And, and, and that's, uh, that's a creed I live by. One, yeah. One of the nice things about our podcast is uh, we don't work for Lear, Learfield Sports. We don't work for anybody. And so – when something like that happens, we basically get to come on here and, and say our opinions and exactly what we want. And uh, we went to bat. We went to bat so hard for you. We went to bat um, on the on the Carson King thing when that was a controversy, and they wanted to fire him or whatever. The reporter was trying to dig into him, and we've taken our fair share of uh, of heat too. Now that we're kind of dipping our our toes into the media world. Um, I got killed when I said Oliver Martin should just stay at Michigan. We, we, uh, we, <laughs> we did a podcast about Oliver Martin transferring into Iowa and um, very similar to the way you describe it. People, people jump to conclusions and love to, uh, to not really dissect things and, and hear what we're saying. And it's tough to take that criticism. Um, it is. I it see, is. Yeah, I see it mostly because I handle our social media. Um, Drake and Kevin kind of, they're pretty good at staying away from that stuff. Um, but we get people all the time who don't listen to us because um, of the first 20 or so episodes that we put out when we were not doing so great with the content and stuff like oh, that. Oh, those, those were some rough episodes back in the day. <laughs> it's my number one wish that people that gave us a chance and then stopped listening, like when we started it, would come back and listen to what we do now because we're so much better. But Well, trust me. Trust me. If they're saying they're not back, they're back. They're back. You know they're coming back to listen. That's and, true. Uh, you know, to me, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't do social media nearly as much as you guys do, 
Uh, I just don't have the time. And, and plus, I probably wouldn't sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> I, I have come to the realization at 68 years of age that uh, you, it, when you're in live radio or live podcasts or you're putting out a, a, a podcast, uh, everything, uh, not everything you say is going to not only please people, but it's really going to upset them mm-hmm. and uh, uh, be hurtful uh, to them or they're going to take it the wrong way uh, is, is what I'm saying. And, and although I try to please everybody, I'm smart enough to know that everything you uh, utter on a Saturday afternoon or a, a, a Tuesday night in January is not going to sit well. Uh, with yep. a certain segment of the fan base. I'm okay with that. I, I accept that. Uh, and, and I'm all obviously open to criticism uh, because uh, we wield a big stick. I mean, we, we're uh, just in radio alone. We're, we get into 42 states at night and uh, we're on XM wow. satellite and we go around the country. And, and so, yeah, I, I understand now if you ask Podolak and Hanson, uh, what do they think? <laughs> they'd be, they'd be a lot like you guys. Absolutely. But, uh, <laughs> We know we have a vast and a huge audience, and uh, if, if we screw up, uh, I'd like to think we're man enough uh, to, to stand up and say, okay, yeah, we made a mistake. We apologize. God knows I've apologized publicly uh, a number of times in my career, uh, most recently uh, last year, and uh, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not the best when it comes to, uh, uh, to every game day or every game night uh, being uh, a hundred percent right in what I'm saying, but I'm also opinionated like you guys are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people uh, confuse the two, but that, that doesn't uh, lessen at all. My love of uh, Iowa fans uh, and our listening base, because we have from great fans, great listeners, great sponsors, uh, great athletes. And we all try and tie it up with a nice, uh, pretty bow. And sometimes uh, you step in, you know what? You step in dung, and, and then you just uh, you clean your shoes off and you move on. What, was it Coach Ferentz that said sometimes you have to eat a shit sandwich? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I know, I know Hayden said that uh, often, and, and I know Kirk has said it too. And uh, You know, right or wrong, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, everybody has an opinion of, of who they hear and how they listen, and, and that's, that's great. I mean, that's what makes radio, uh, you know, I, I wish, do I wish it was more like the sixties and seventies and eighties before the internet? Yeah. But I also understand why, why social media is here. Where would we be today in this environment now in this socially, uh, separation, uh, socially, uh, what's social distancing, distancing, socially distancing. That's what I'm, I had a brain fart there. Sorry guys. Uh, where would we be, uh, you know, in your own home, almost on lockdown uh, around the country without uh, avenues like this podcast uh, or radio uh, or television or the social or the internet or social media. Yeah. Uh, it'd be pretty boring. Really, really would. Kevin, Drake, anything that you guys want to get in for sure before this thing? I have, yeah, I have one thing left for sure. And it's, I, I don't know how well you know our guy, Brady Ross, but he's one of our best friends. Uh, I know Brady the, well. One of the most unique human beings of all time. And he's also a huge fan of yours. And I don't know if you know this, has the best Dolph impersonation outside of yourself that I've ever heard. So I was just, I mean, Brady listens to our episodes and he's going to come on every once in a while, or uh, eventually. But I just wanted to, you to maybe – Maybe talk about Brady a little bit. I always like to talk about my guy. Well, Brady uh, is a special person. Uh, we all know the tragedy that uh, he and his family went through mm-hmm. uh, up in uh, one of the great communities. I was up in Humboldt uh, last summer uh, for Dallas Clark's uh, niece, who's battling a, who was battling a severe form of, of uh, cancer. Uh, she's a great high school softball player, just a sweetheart, a beauty of a girl. And uh, they had close to 3,000 people at the, at the, uh, the diamond that night and wow. raised a ton of money for her trips to Mayo and for her treatment. And so the Clark family from nearby Livermore and Humboldt is a very special place uh, for me. And we had Iowa play Iowa state, you know, former Iowa, Iowa state athletes get together for a softball game. I am seated. And it was a great, and, and the, and the Ross family was there. And so Brady, I've gotten to know, in fact, at the uh, Kirkwood hotel, where the guys stay on Friday night. I'm walking down to interview Kirk one Friday night before a Saturday game. Here comes Brady. I said, and Kulik told me about uh, the impersonator. 
and the impersonation he does. And, and I think, uh, I think it, you might have been a, a junior or a sophomore, Drake, when you told, first told me that. Yeah, I would I said, have probably been a junior. Maybe a junior, yeah, because I remember you telling me that. And I said, hey, Brady, uh, I've been told you do a pretty good Gary Dolphin. And he almost melted right in the hallway. He had a teammate, I can't remember who was walking with him, was an offensive lineman. I said, come on, just give me a, just give me a, oh, I can't right now. I can't right now. And he walked right, he almost sprinted past me. Oh. And, and so that, I thought, okay, so the guy I, must be embarrassed to uh, impersonate Dolphin. I said, gee whiz. So I've since talked to his, uh, uh, you know, his, his immediate family members. They said, oh yeah, he does a great Dolph. So well, I got to get him to, to, to do it for me. So maybe, Maybe get him to do it on the podcast, uh, and then give me a heads up, uh, Tyler, or somebody, <laughs> I as, to when, as to when uh, you're going to do that, and I'll tune in. Don't tell him I'm on listening. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get you the video of it. I'll, I'll send it to you and make sure that happens. But he, um, he, used, to, he used to do your, the impersonation. I don't know. We were just talking about it before you got on here. Um, either our junior or senior year, uh, they did an intro video, a, a promo video where you had this line. It was, um, there had been like 243 days since we last played in the bowl game. And your line was like, it was one minute before they, before we walked out of the tunnel for our first game of the year. And it, your line was like 243 days. And now just one minute. And Brady could do that line. And if you weren't looking at him and knew that it was him, you would have thought that you were in the room, Gary. It was. It was. You, know, you got. You guys will back him up on that. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was, it it was it. so spot on that if you close your eyes, you would be like, "Wow, that's Dolph." Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm I'm fired up now uh, uh, to hear uh, uh, the Ross impersonation. You know, it, that's part it's of a the real shame that he got cold feet uh, do it, to do it in front of you because that's not the first time Brady's gotten cold feet. Really? On I think he was, almost, he was almost embarrassed that I brought it up. I think because he had a couple teammates walking with him, but you know, that wouldn't phase me at all. And, you know, but, but the bigger picture is one of the great thrills at Podolak and I, I'm keeping it football here that we get out of uh, covering Iowa football is we get to know your folks. We get to know your brothers and sisters and your relatives are all at the bowl game. And, and, uh, Kevin, uh, that Hank was a road trip to Illinois. Oh yeah. Where, uh, my, my dad always talks about when oh he sees you God. in Borlack. I had yeah. a headache the next morning. Let me tell you, <laughs> hanging out with your dad. Yeah. That's your a not the involved. only one that woke up with a headache after oh. hanging out with the wards. Yeah. It's, uh, I thought, I thought, <laughs> yeah, well, dad, uh, dad is a hoot. Let me tell you, mom's a sweetheart. Yeah. Dad is a real hoot. And then of course, Ryan is a, is a piece of work too. <laughs> but of That's course, I'm soft with this because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, keep my broadcast of professionalism about me. You guys don't have to do that, but we, we, I think I got to bed at two or two thirty, uh, <laughs> Champagne Urbana, and this wasn't that long ago. Now I think was was Ryan. I think Ryan was a senior, if I'm not mistaken. What year was that? That would have been 2016. 2016. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, of course, Podolak has the has the advantage of walking into the booth just as the game is about to start. You know, I got to be there for the full damn two hour pregame show. <laughs> and, and so uh, and I, I, th I think it was an early, early kick that day. It was. It was. And, it was yeah, 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 of course yeah. it was. So uh, <laughs> I, I limped into the uh, broadcast booth. Of course, the only advantage there is when you've had, uh, you've been overserved a little bit is the voice is about eight octaves lower than normal. So <laughs> yes. I sound like a porn star when I first came here. Uh, but uh, no. It, it's all good, but I get that's just another example of getting to know uh, Pat Anger's dad was uh, like a 45 year John Deere worker from from Moline or Bentendorf, just the toughest guy you'd ever want to run into. Uh, I've got some great stories, and then of course I have the privilege of introducing the parents mm -hmm. at the uh, Hawkeye Huddle uh, every year at the bowl game, and and that's one of the things I really look forward to is uh, is to uh, see the Kuliks or the Kluvers or, or, or the Ward uh, family <clears throat> and the Ward families and, and hang out and have a beverage or two. Uh, but uh, yeah, your dad, uh, Kevin, is, uh, they broke the mold on, on that guy. Let me tell you. <laughs> he said, he mentioned to me uh, after the game, uh, you know, I come out and he's like, man, we, we, we put a number on Dolph last night. <laughs> put, a nod on, put a nod on my head. Let me tell you. <laughs> and you know, this all starts out because, uh, 
you know, your dad and, and, and our dads uh, are, are maybe the last generation that remember when Ed Podolak played football uh, uh-huh. because uh, his career has been over. But, but he's a Kansas City Chief. He's got that Super Bowl ring on and, and, and the name. There aren't many guys that have their names on the inside ribbon of a stadium, on that, that ring of fame, as they call mm-hmm. it. Podolak's up there. Bobby Hansen wins an NBA title with the Bulls. Uh, so we circle back to those two guys. Uh, they are what really make the broadcast so doggone entertaining uh, on game day. I mean, they nobody knows the game better than they do. Uh, you know, I, I tell people, my job is to tell you what happened. They tell you why it happened or how it happened. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and, that's, and, and as you guys know, you three, it's tough to work with a three-man booth. Uh, it's tough to uh, develop chemistry. You got to get hooked up with the right guys. You guys clearly have uh, solved that issue. And with Podolak and I and Bobby and I, we've, we've developed great chemistry over the years. And otherwise, the broadcast wouldn't be nearly as entertaining as it is. It's certainly been fantastic to listen to. Dolph, is there anything before we let you go? We don't, we don't want to take up your entire Sunday evening, but is there anything that you wanted to get to and talk about uh, We'll definitely have you on again at some point when we have sure. time. But uh, now that I know what Zoom is and what you know, sure. how to on a pod- and and I'm doing podcasts now. I did. I know. This week. Yeah. Who yeah, just opens up with the head coach? Well, I don't. Yeah, you know, I I do have his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. We just start yeah. on a different level. Yeah. I'm one of his biggest supporters, and as I found out uh, here recently, he's a he's a big supporter of me, which I'll be for forever grateful. And uh, uh, you know, I think. It, you know, to wrap this up, guys, uh, you three are, are three, three big reasons why I love doing Iowa, covering Iowa football, uh, because uh, I think as much of special teams guys as I do, uh, uh, you know, the Ricky Stanzies and the Chuck Longs and, and uh, the Tavian Banks and uh, Akram Wadleys and Adrian Claiborne's and Pat Angers of the world. And I didn't even get to the secondary and Boy, those guys! How how good has Iowa been in the the secondary? The They've last been all right years? with Hooker, and Phil Parker, with Ward, and uh, yeah, no, no, I can't shut out Phil Parker, uh, and you know the great tight ends. Uh, I, I don't care, pick a position. Uh, Keith Duncan uh, last year. It's been so much fun to 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 watch Iowa football, to call Iowa football down through the years because you're getting contributions from all three phases, and I think that that's the signature of Iowa football. It isn't just; it's never just the offense. Never just the defense, never never the punter or kicker alone. It's all three phases pulling together. And I think that's such a testament to uh, who Kirk Ferentz is. Because this guy knows uh, better than most how important all three phases are to the game. We try to tell the fans that. Sometimes they don't understand. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't get what they don't understand. I mean, to me, it's all about field position. And special teams, It's the game starts with special teams. That's why I hate, I hate this new damn rule about fair catching a kickoff. Yeah. Hate it. Uh, Hate it. It's disgusting. Hate it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, they always said, you know, put a dress on the quarterback uh, to me. And I, Hey, look, I get where they're coming from on, you know, protecting and the safety of the game and uh, the safety of the, of the athlete. I get all that, but my God, fair catch a kickoff. I didn't think I'd ever live long enough to see that. Uh, I mean, at, at, at some point we get, we have to, you know, uphold the integrity of the game of football. Yeah, and at some point we just gotta draw a line and say this is the football anymore. I, I think I think they'll they'll go back and review some of those things uh, as the game presses on. But you know the immediate thing right now is is to college football. There there's not there's not one sport out there that is more popular or more fun to watch than college football. I mean it it really is. It, it's in its purest state uh, as it was back at the turn of the century obviously with some rule changes that we're, uh, that we're not happy with. But uh, it's, it's the reason stadiums are still, for the most part, full each and every game day. Uh, the ticket prices are, are uh, for the most part, affordable. I know it's tough to take a family of four or five to a game, but Saturday afternoon at Kinnick Stadium, you guys have said it, uh, there, there's nothing it's, better. There's nothing like it. Yeah, on, both sides of the, on both sides of the fence, too, man. Being a fan these days, it's – it's not nearly as cool as being a player, but it's hella fun. That's for damn sure. How about the tailgating, Kevin? That's still pretty good. Oh. <laughs> the tailgating is pretty good. So Saturday October. mornings are a little bit better now than they were, you know, four or five years ago. But yeah. around 11 o'clock, I start missing being in the black and gold. You start getting goosebumps again, don't you? Fired oh, up. Oh, every, every time. Every time you see the swarm, man. 
Well, I'll tell you what the sound systems they have now when Back in Black starts up in that tunnel, the guys start coming down that tunnel. I don't know there's a bigger thrill anywhere. I mean, everybody has their shtick that they run, but uh, that, that's pretty special. That new I tunnel mean, is going to be insane. I'm so oh jealous. My yeah, it, it, you're right. It, you're right. I mean, the improvements they put into that stadium. And, and you know, I'm a hu huge history buff, so I'm all for uh, keeping Kinnick uh, forever and ever and ever. And you think the, the, the great players, the great names that have come out of that tunnel, whether it's uh, small, narrow, uh, or, or what we have today, um, starting from Duke Slater to, to Niall Kinnick to uh, the great Evashevsky teams of the 60s to Hayden and now to you guys uh, era and, and, uh, and beyond. It's just a... And it has a lot to do with the colors, you know. To me, it's it's just it's, an iconic it's, building. It's plain Jane. It's a great stadium. It's black and gold, and nothing fancy. It's a Pittsburgh Steeler looking, you know, uh, one for the thumb. Uh, that's Hawkeye football, and it's physical, and it's all about defense, and it's all about field position, and it's all about making plays, and it's about running the football. So there you go, all three phases. You guys were so involved in all three, and. Uh, it was an honor to do your games, and I'll, I'll look forward to our next visit. It was – Well, Dolph, it's – Yeah, go I, for it. I was going to say, well, Dolph, man, uh, the thing that we all miss most about being a Hawkeye is the family, and you were for damn sure part of that Hawkeye family. So, man, we appreciate you having you on. It was awesome to hear some of your stories. And, you know, we, uh, we look forward to having you on again sometime. Hey, guys, I'll, I, I didn't tell all the stories. I'll have a couple more for you next time, okay? <laughs> we, we know you will. We know you will. It was an absolute I'm pleasure. sure I'll be in Muscatine and Marshalltown before the summer's out. Uh, and uh, I know I'll be in Chicago, uh, Kevin's uh, home area. But I'm uh, still in Iowa City these days, so you can I know come you by. Uh, yeah, I know you know can you come are. by hang out anytime you want, Dolph. No, with you, I'm going to see Dad. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know he, what that's fair that's we fair. have we that's have Podolak, yeah Podolak and i have an open invitation to uh hang out on your deck uh in, in chicagoland and well uh, you know what if you could uh make sure that i also get that invitation that'd be appreciated. <laughs> we'll let you know we'll let you know we'll see if big brother wants you there number one but i uh, you know closing at least from my end it's, it's been great seeing you guys uh Hopefully, I'll have video the next time. I'm just I'm having the equipment installed. I don't have a camera in my computer, but I'm getting a laptop with a camera in it. So next time, you should be able to see my four-day growth of beard and uh, when we when we next visit. But I, I want to urge people to uh, to isolate, to to stay home, uh, other than immediate family, certainly. And uh, this has been such a devastating pandemic, you know, like like we haven't seen in our lifetime. And because uh, I want to see everybody back at Kinnick Stadium here in a couple of short months. And we will get through it. We'll have, we'll have football. I, I feel so bad for the Luca Garzas and the Spencer Lees and the Kathleen Doyles uh, uh, of uh, recent memory who, who were robbed of an opportunity to play in postseason. Uh, but, you know, it's not all about college sports. It's about life. It's about health, uh, good health. And uh, they'll have other opportunities down the road. But I wish uh, everybody a great offseason, including you guys. And, you know, if you get uh, if you get strapped for some content, uh, you got my number. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you heard that. You heard that here, people. Wash your hands. Stay inside. We need football season this year. We need football because we need Dolph. That that's really <laughs> how it goes. Um, again, Dolph, thanks for joining us. That was episode one hundred and six of the podcast. And uh, as always, it's Hawks by a million. Heart don't have stars. Thank you, Dolph. Dolphins, the goat. Gary Thanks, Dolphins, guys. the goat, and uh, walk-ons out.